So, my name is Stefan Stenzel, as this gentleman said. I have made quite a number of synthesizers in the past. Um, and some of these synthesizers also had vocoders. So, I was constantly unhappy with vocoders and started uh, developing, questioning how to do that. So, uh, that's the reason why I came up with the idea of giving a talk about vocoders now. So, before I start, has any one of you ever used a vocoder? Let's see. Oh, that's quite a lot. Has any one of you ever made a vocoder? Wow. You made half a vocoder. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just for clarification, the vocoder I'm going to talk about is the music vocoder and also some comparisons to the military and civil use of vocoders. Uh, I'm not talking about vocoders like things that are named vocoders, like phase vocoder, which is a wonderful time frequency manipulation thing, but it's out of the scope of this talk because it's just called vocoder, but it has nothing to do with voice. Vocoder, if you don't know, is short for voice coder, and it was basically invented in the 30s with first um, usable items in the 40s. So... Vocoders have historically different purposes. The main purpose is civil and military. It's like for speech transmission with compression and especially encryption so that no party could intercept what the parties were talking to each other. Well, but we musicians, we mainly are interested in like robotic voices, you know that? Yeah? Or making music and hiding the fact that you cannot really sing, yeah? which is true for me. So it all boils down to the channel vocoder. This is a image from a, uh, one of the first patents from 1935 from Homer Dudley who is kind of the godfather of all vocoders and speech synthesizers as well. Yeah. And here you can see analysis section and synthesis section. Uh, well, you can also see that it still has coils and tubes. And um, of course, it's very analog because well, they didn't have digital by the, those days. For those who don't know, Oh, okay, let me first see. This is a, a vocoder. It was in use 1943 to 1946. It was quite secret. Uh, the confidentiality was ended in 1976, but by that time nobody was interested in this old technology. But it's a fantastic thing. It was a vocoder that was used by the Allies to communicate safely like between uh, um, America and Paris or so, or, or, or Britain, so that the bad guys, the evil Germans, <coughs> they are really evil, <laughs> they, they, that they couldn't intercept. Yeah? And that really worked. And some parts of the thing were already kind of digital or so, so it was an awesome machine. Very sadly, we will never know what it sounded like because no working item... Um, is still intact and no recording of this exists or so, but it's a fantastic piece of technology, especially if you consider that it's not so long ago, and nowadays we are all having this and a lot more in our pocket every day. So the original use was military use, or, yeah. And this is yeah, my little drawing how a vocoder, a basic channel vocoder works. Most of you will know that, but I spoke to some, so let me briefly recapitulate. There's an analysis filter bank, and after that, there are kind of envelope followers, and those envelope followers, they control some VCAs, which control the synthesis filter bank, which is, gets the carrier signal, that should be the signal that is, um, yeah, where the speech is modulated on, and then you have the output. The carrier signal can be anything. It can be a guitar or organ or whatever or so, what you like for music purpose. However, for 
communication, there was usually more. There was a voice on voice detector and a pitch detector. And well, the carrier signal was either a pitched um, waveform or noise for doing like sibilance or noises that are important for proper speech. Sadly, none of the music vocoders really has this. Huh? Um, or here, maybe this is more clear. This is the original drawing, I think, by Homer Dudley from 1940, how it works. I find it amazing. So you see here the spectrum. These are kind of the bands that are analyzed here. <clears throat> they go to the filter bank here. But also, he already had a, a pitch detector, which detected the fundamental frequency and the voice unvoice detector, which operated the switch between bus and his. I find it quite amazing for this time. Yeah? It was 1940, and he already depicted a woman with brain and ideas. Yeah? <laughs> I like it. So before we hear a channel vocoder, let's briefly recap what the frequency response of the filter bank is. So, HV is the response of the vocoder. It's just the sum of all the individual filters. It's a little bit math. You can doze off if you're interested in that. Multiplied by A, which are the envelopes. Yeah? So each individual filter, usually, if you know a little bit about signal processing, is usually yeah, has a, a, a term, a denominator, and a denominator. Just imagine this. Nominator, I think it's the thing on top, already has the A multiplied in it. So what happens when we add two? You see, this is addition. Well, some basic elementary math, and we end up with a term where we figure out, hmm. In the end, we have a term where only this part change, this part keeps constant. Yeah? So this is the reason why the channel vocoder is particularly bad at picking up resonances. Because basically, it just constructs a, 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 the variable part. It's just um, a finite impulse response filter. And the constant part are the resonances. And um, this is really not so great. And this is why most channel vocoders don't really sound so great. This is a typical um, attempt to get a flat frequency response from a number of channels in the digital domain. Oh, by the way, furious thing, can I go back here? This applies both to digital or analog system. So it's, you can make, make it uh, in, in the uh, Laplace uh, La transform, in the Z, S domain or Z domain. It doesn't really matter very much. The result is the same. So they both are not very good at um, providing a good spectral envelope or for catching resonances of the vocal tract. So this is an attempt to get a flat response with different resonances. And you see, um, you always have a trade-off. Either you have sharp resonances, which will be present, like always present, and have certain notches and peaks in the spectrum, or you get some flat thing, but then you are not really able, your filters are so broad that you cannot really uh, get a proper spectral envelope. Yeah. It gets a little bit better with higher order filters, but not, not very much, to be honest. So that's just a hint for myself to demonstrate the channel vocoder. OK, so I take an example from, it's from Janis Joplin. I think it's fair use to use it. And this is the channel vocoder. And well, it's a little bit embarrassing because it doesn't really sound very good. I, tr I tried not deliberately to make it sound bad. Um, I tried different methods to make it sound better, but you will see. Um, it always kind of sucks. 
So there's several things you can do. Don't know if you can see it. You can um, add more channels or change the start and end frequency or change the resonance or even make the, the addition with alternate signs. Or what I have here is an inhibition. That means if a certain band will not always control its own band, but will inhibit the, other, the neighboring bands to get a sharper response. So all of this helps, but never to the extent that I'm really happy with the results. So um, I'm going to try this a little bit, I and mean, I'm going to fail. Yeah? Um, so let's listen here. This is, by the way, just a Janis Joplin sample and some notes playing. On. So, so I increase the channels. But you also notice you, I have a little graph here, which shows the not only the frequency response in blue, but also the phase response, which is constantly changing, which is also kind of annoying if you have a fast adaption rate of the vocoder. Uh, and it gets even worse if I try to trick it into catching the spectral envelope better. So I try and I fail. Try. So you see the face gets much worse if I have the alternate thing. So it gets even worse the face if I uh, um, put some inhibition there. And it doesn't even really get better if I increase the number of bands or if I increase the resonance. It gets a little bit better, but it all sounds kind of mushy and I don't know, I don't really like it. So let's get back, demonstrate the channel vocoder. But sadly, the channel vocoder is what most musicians use and what most vocoders nowadays are. Even if you look in, at manufacturer websites for like companies like Roland and they explain a vocoder, they only explain the channel vocoder, which is a little bit weird. This is a channel, this is the Sennheiser vocoder that was built 1977 to 1982 channel vocoder, by the way. Um, and during this time, something interesting happened. Some of you might, might know this guy. His name is Kai Krause. And uh, during this time, he had the wonderful job from Dr. Sennheiser personally to tour through California and demonstrate, sell, land, and operate this vocoder to musicians. So he spent five years traveling through California, meeting people like Frank Zappa, Herbie Hancock, Keith Emerson, and Joni Mitchell, and all the hot shots, and showed them vocoders, and was paid quite well also as a vocoder operator. So must have been a quite nice life there these five years. Later, he became known for graphic software, like Goo or Bryce or so. Yeah? Uh, I talked to him about the time with Sennheiser, and he told me a lot. He couldn't, he's hard to stop once he uh, starts talking. But the interesting thing he told me, just in passing, was, yeah, Dr. Sennheiser told him that this was just a spin-off of a vocoder that was previously used in, for, for military use. So uh, I talked to the guys at or some girl at Sennheiser, and she told me, oh, I, I have to go back. Um, hold on, back. That this is true, that the predecessor was really in use for communication between embassies and foreign offices between um, different states during the Cold War. Yeah? And this one was then simplified, they left out certain things, and also said, they, it had a fixed key, which implies that uh, a permutation of the channels was used as a mean of encrypting the signal. Huh? 
and transmitting it safely. I don't know how much safety a permutation of 20 channels is or so, but well, it was enough in those days, I think. So <clears throat> back to the channel vocoder frequency response. We've seen that this is not the ideal thing because, well, it doesn't pick up resonances very good and it always sounds a little bit mushy. Not really robot-like or so, yeah? So wouldn't it be possible to have something like this instead? I mean, we, we know this from like equalizers. When we have an equalizer, a multi-channel equalizer, we usually put the bands in sequence and not in parallel. And there is a good reason for that because it's much better to get a proper spectral envelope. As soon as we would add filters, everything goes to hell and you get notches and uh, um, strange face all over the place. So this is in, in fact possible. Uh, I tried it. The problem is, as soon as one of those terms becomes zero, well, the whole output is zero. So you have to kind of factor in the overall gain of the system and make sure that there is a gain setting uh, before or after and um, decide on that. So I made a little recording of that. It doesn't sound very good also. Oh, you can't hear it, huh? It doesn't sound very good anyway. So um, I tried that and I said, no, I'm also not happy with that. Um, but let's look at the other side. As I said, 1976, the Six Sally documentation was um, no more confidential and also the Sennheiser vocoder technology became uh, um, available for uses other than military or diplomatic use. The reason is, at that time, digital vocoders already were much more powerful than the analog ones. And they had one thing in common, they all were based on uh, linear, predictive, linear prediction. Linear prediction is, and they were called like LPC vocoders, mainly software vocoders. Um, the thing with linear prediction is, the idea is quite simple. You try to predict the signal from previous signals by means of um, kind of a filter or weighing past samples and get the next sample and then doing that over and over, which basically is a all pole filter, a only recursive filter. And of course, you have a, an error function, which is the difference between the estimation of the signal and the true signal. And the complicated part is to get the, the real filter. There is a solution to that, minimizing the um, mean root error uh, of, the, of the mean root error signal. It's a little bit complicated. It's called Levins and Durbin. Living on Durbin recursion, but just keep in mind it uses the autocorrelation. Has anybody of you ever used the autocorrelation or knows what it is? Yeah. So you might know, I mean, I love the autocorrelation. It's an amazing tool for all kinds of things. Um, but let's not step ahead. This is a note for myself, demonstrate our placebo coder. I hope it kind of works this time. So we just show some channel vocoder. A little recap. Okay, and we go to LPC vocoder. Yeah, so I think this works better. You can increase the order here. Sorry for the plops. Uh, you can see here that it's much my better at picking up resonances because the LPC vocoder is an old pole vocoder. So it's, um, there is no uh, a finite impulse response part other than maybe a constant gain factor. And um, I think it sounds much better than the channel vocoder. That's of course the reason uh, um, 
why the channel vocoder was abandoned for serious or military or any other um, projects since the 70s because it was sounded better and it was way easier to realize in software. Yeah? Only we musicians, we were left with the old channel vocoder for decades as a de facto standard, yeah? which is not the best solution, to put it mildly. So let's get back to vocoders. So, um, now comes to Paul. I made a new vocoder. I thought it was new. And so, what shall we do with it? Shall, well, you want to hear it? Yes, yes. Or shall I explain the math? Yeah. <laughs> or shall I show the code? Yeah. Yeah. Or shall I open source it? Yeah. <laughs> what shall I do first? Yeah. What? Hear it first. Hear it first. Okay, that's a good choice, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Please, logic, don't leave me. Oh, open recent. So, um, I hope it's that one. Don't save. Okay. Oh, Lord. Okay, it's basically the same In stupid melody. My friends all drive four shoes. I must make a Okay, one more time. Oh, Lord. Don't you buy me? Okay, so what's the perceived quality of that? Good or bad? Better than channel vocoder? Worse than channel vocoder? You like it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I like it too. Yeah. So, okay. So, what's next? Open source it, math, or code? You say code. Okay. That's quite clear. So, So this is the code. And um, you see some um, familiar things perhaps here. Can you read that all? Or no, 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 I need to increase the this, this size a little bit. OK. Yeah, the whole screen resolution changed when you, uh, so. Apple equal to. Increase the size. Thank you, sir. That's good, yeah. Okay, I press Apple equal once again. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the beauty of it is that it, the whole vocoder fits on a screen. I don't have to scroll. I don't really have to go to another uh, file or so. This is it. Yeah. Um, so I, ca I can go through this a little bit. You'll see this. I don't know, really know if we need these anymore, but it's, uh, if you make a juice project, it's just in there. Yeah. This is just for the synthesizer. No, I don't need to. So there's a very simple pitch synchronous synthesizer that just plays back the autocorrelation. Um, and this just gets, whenever a note on comes, calculates a delta for a phase accumulation meter or so. I think you're mostly familiar with that. By the way, the code style, the style is here aimed at simplicity. It won't gain any points for, for um, a good style or whatever or so. I don't think it would pass the test for uh, use uh, uh, code style guidelines or whatever. But it works and it's simple and it fits into one screen. So yeah, you get the pointers and then we have a loop over the samples. So this is where it happens. So we have a ring buffer called conveniently X for the inputs. Put some source file and then we have a loop where we calculate an autocorrelation of lags. So those for, of you who are familiar with autocorrelation might notice a little bit saying it's a little bit modified autocorrelation, I will come to that later, um, that it forgets the previous autocorrelation. It doesn't do a full summation, it's a leaky thing and it just calculates, uh, yeah, the in time domain, the leaky autocorrelation. And 
the hack is I can get away with like uh, um, things like this because my buffers are 250, a size of 256, and I just use unsigned chars as index, which works perfectly for me, and it's also a perfect size for, for this. Huh? So I, that's all I do here. Whenever the, I do the phase increment, like everybody does for oscillators, and if the phase wraps, I just throw a windowed segment of the autocorrelation into the output buffer. I add those because they can overlap, of course, yeah? So you see, there's a gain correction factor. I, I will come to that later, why that is needed. And uh, you see the output buffer, why? Just uh, uh, first the autocorrelation backwards times a window and then the autocorrelation forwards. Because you, you all know the autocorrelation is a symmetric function, but for convenience, we mostly calculate only one half of that. So that's all. Any questions about that code or so? Is it comprehensible or is it awkward? Okay, there are no coders here, I think. What? <laughs> about, about? The constants. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, yeah. You are, you are right. I could have left out the constants for simplicity. Yeah. Okay. Back. So um, you heard it. I showed you the code. Okay. I go ahead and open source it. So this is it. Simple vocoder. I just go to settings. And I go right into the danger zone and make it public. Please type. Uh, oh, I don't type this now. I, I thought it was easy. Okay, I promise I'll do it later. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to type anything right now. Yeah. So it's open source. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Um, some reasons why it's not production ready is it has a fixed sample rate, it has a fixed block size, it has a fixed forgetting factor, and it's not really pitch synchronous because the pitch is quantized to a sample. There is no subsample accuracy. But for, for voices, you sometimes get away with it very easily because, well, humans, human voice, the glottis, is also not so very accurate. And in fact, sometimes some inaccuracy, some noise in the voice actually helps perceive because it can carry more spectral ferment information if it's not completely periodic. So now the bad part that you all dread, um, explaining the math about it. First, some amazing facts about the autocorrelation. I really love the autocorrelation. Did I mention that? It's easy to calculate in time domain there's a fast way to calculate it by the uh, fast Fourier transform, um, just because, well, the autocorrelation is basically a, um, a convolution of the signal with itself or with the time reversed version of itself. Uh, that can be proven either by the convolution theorem or by the Wiener Kinchim theorem, but that's too complicated. That's for complex signals. So, um, and it's very useful, like for not only for linear prediction also for pitch detection. Has anyone of you already done pitch detection? Let's see, did you use autocorrelation? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, there are other things, but it's quite okay. Yeah, so it's symmetric. Um, it's, ha, it loses the phase information, which is sometimes good. Basically, these three are the same. It has linear phase because there is no phase information anymore. Yeah? But, and that's kind of the bad thing about it, it has the squared magnitude, not the absolute magnitude, which is, hmm, which is bad, because that means I can't really do it. It's kind of useless. But I did it anyway. So, um, what could be the solution to that? I have no idea. So, okay. Okay. So, 
So my vocoder is an autocorrelation vocoder. It's based on autocorrelation. It's easy, fast, and wrong because the response is the squared magnitude, but we want that, but we don't have that. Uh, so, and what's even worse, I thought I invented the autocorrelation vocoder, but some guy beat me to it. It was a guy called Edward David in 1960. You see here the pattern for autocorrelation vocoder. It didn't take off. It didn't take off for a reason, because he had, I think he had the same problem, and he had a solution that was, for that time, quite cumbersome. Yeah? So, uh, one option, that's the one I, I use in the open source. You saw that there's a, a scale term with a square root. So basically, if you look at the autocorrelation, you see that the first term of the autocorrelation is, in, in fact, the summation of the signal squared, which is kind of related to the uh, root mean square of the, the whole signal. So you can get away with scaling just by this uh, factor. So um, you still get uh, this response, but scaled by a correction factor that the overall gain is at least kind of correct. Huh? So this is what happens in this uh, thing, in the simple vocoder. Uh, surprisingly, it works. I mean, it's not the best vocoder, but it kind of works. So another option, what if we take the autocorrelation and change the multiplication to some other operation. Now, the math wizards of you will say, okay, you can't do that. Huh? But, well, I just do it, and, well, surprisingly, it works. There's a number of operations you can do instead of a multiplication for the autocorrelation that also yield some good results. So, in order to get more like a magnitude, not a squared magnitude response, I have some desired properties for the function. Like, any, if one of those terms is zero, it should be zero. If two identical values are there, it should be the, the uh, absolute value. And if they differ in sign, it should be negative. So, yeah. so these are the um, requirements, properties, constraints, or so. And if we look at different functions, the multiplication, well, and this function, for example, the sine of the product times the root of the absolute thing, or another function, the sine, the minimum of the absolute thing. And um, you can easily see the multiplication, well, just ticks one box, but the others tick two boxes. So. Um, I decided for, for this one, for a single reason, because, well, how do I go back? Because it can be simplified if I use, replace x by a modified version of x. This comes down to the autocorrelation of that, only that I have to do a pre-processing, like a distortion pre-processing with this function. And for those of you who do nonlinearities or overdrive, so this is an interesting function because you get the same harmonic distortion regardless of the, vol of the input volume. Huh? So, next thing, usually for, for LPC or something like that, you have a block autocorrelation where you calculate the complete autocorrelation for one block size n, but what I did here is some leaky autocorrelation where you have um, updated constantly, forget the old correlation. Um, I think most of you are familiar with it. The advantage is like you have a, it's continuous, and the most recent uh, values is, has the, the highest magnitude, uh, so, sounds okay. Um, yeah, so, it's the okay. The um, third option of the autocorrelation vocoder that we heard is um, the FFT correction. 
That means we have here a signal deoptic relation which with the squared magnitude. The easy solution would be to say, okay, we just take the FFT of that, take the square of that, and do an inverse FFT. Um, and that is actually what E. Edward Davis proposed in his original patent. You see here a Fourier transformation network, square root taken circles, and inverse Fourier transformation network, which for 1960 was quite complicated. So this is the reason the autocorrelation vocoder didn't really take off, and LPC was uh, uh, far superior to that. No. But if we take the FFT of the autocorrelation, uh, we already know that we the FFT is a way to, to, to calculate the autocorrelation efficiently. So we might really consider skipping the step to calculate the autocorrelation in time domain entirely and go directly to the short time uh, Fourier transformation book. I don't know if the math term is right, but basically you just take a snippet of your signal, window it, and um, take the magnitude, and there you have your filter. And all you need is a time-varying low-latency convolution at the back end to do the vocoding. I actually did this in a hardware product. In the last product I did for this company called Waldorf. Yeah. Sadly, I didn't bring this instrument here, but okay, you can listen to it, how it comes from. Oh, yeah. So, um, trust me, it's very short. The nice thing about this, by the way, that was <clears throat> uh, me singing into this vocoder, kind of live. Yeah? And the nice thing about this is that you can use it to change the perceived gender of the voice. Or did any one of you perceive a female voice with this? It was mostly sounding a little bit femaleish, or wasn't it? Oh, okay, so um, not so many vocoders do this. Yeah? Um, there's also another guy, you see it here, this is uh, also this vocoder, yeah? Tom Cardi, an excellent musician. If you want to, um, he makes excellent use of vocoders, so um, he should be far more famous than he already is. So if you really want to hear excellent use of different vocoders in a single song, maybe watch his videos. They are hilarious and they're excellent music. Yeah? This one. <laughs> yeah, well, I love him. Yeah? So, uh, um, and I love that he's using my vocoder. Yeah. So um, now, no. So um, that brings me to hopefully showing another vocoder. I hope this is it. Genesis number two. Oh. You realize that I really like Janice Joplin. Huh? So let's listen to them. Oh Lord, don't you buy a Mercedes Benz? Oh. My friends all drive Porsches. I must make. So this is the FFT vocoder, yeah, and. I make it a little bit bigger so you can see. Because uh, you see the spectrum here. And this here is kind of a, a, an equalizer for the vocoder. You may think, yeah, an equalizer, that's nothing very special. But <clears throat> this equalizer has a certain uh, property. Usually you go up and down with the frequencies. But here you can also move frequencies sideways. Um, 
and changing the ferment characteristic with it. Do you want to hear that or shall yes. I? Yeah. So shall we try to make transform poor Janus into a very big man or so, something like that or so? Okay. I, hmm? yes. I, I try. Yeah. Just bear with me. So. Oh Lord! So. Don't you ban me? Hey, mercy. First, we lower the pitch by two octaves. Yeah. Just a moment. Oh Lord! Don't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, my friends are... So the pitch is slower, but it doesn't really sound like like a, a man or something like that. Oh, no. so, but I changed the equalizer here, moving things up and down and sideways. So bear with me. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, my friends all drive Porsches, I must make amen. Okay, so you get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so the reason that, that it, this is so easy with an FFT vocoder was the reason that I used it in this um, um, SCVC and this uh, uh, keyboard. Huh? And one other thing, you, you might have noticed that I'm using a pitch detector here. Yeah? This is nothing new in Vokodas. Vokodas had this like since, uh, uh, since the 40s or so, yeah? Recently there was a, a company announcing it as a very novel thing and a channel vocoder with pitch detector, yeah, but it's, uh, and by the way, it can also... You see the melody is off because I'm using a, a uh, Auto-tune style pitch correction, where I say sing it in uh, F sharp major, which is not the key of the original song. So that's basically the idea. So what you can do, we could do what I just showed: um, follow the pitch of the speech. One other thing, unvoice detection and noise injection. I didn't show that yet. That's also a feature I showed you in the original Homo Dudley uh, drawing that there's the voiced unvoice detector and it makes um, the speech mu much more intelligible if we add that. So um, I might go back here to good old logic. Am I still in time? Five minutes, yeah. Well, I don't have so much more to say anyway, so. <laughs> So we start like with, yeah. Oh Lord. Okay. Okay. Well, are the LPC recorders on? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. So I can inject white noise before the signal, or just take the original Sybil lens or so, which adds a lot to the um, intelligibility of the speech. Um, so, that was basically it. If you have any questions or suggestions or so, I'm at your service right now. So we have a couple of minutes left for questions. The German gentleman here. Brilliant, especially the demos. Um, I wonder what can be done to make it sound more natural? Um, more natural, well... Um, I mean, usually we, we make vocoders, we use them to make uh, the opposite, make them sound uh, less natural. But to make them sound more natural, um, first of all, the pitch detection that I use here is not, um, could improve that. And to make it more natural, um, the, the, we need a proper model of the glottis. 
Uh, so um, we don't need a, a pure periodic signal, but with some um, yeah uh, imperfection. Yeah, uh, that would make it. That I think that would be sufficient to make it properly um, realistic. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in your uh, FFT vocoder, how do you deal with the uh, discontinuities between the blocks? Do you like lose the phase or you randomize the phase? How do you stitch um, them together? Thank you. Uh, well, there's uh, I have I haven't showed that. Maybe I can go back and show it to you. I have uh, something called adaption rate. Yeah, so I'm doing like like a moving average and also like a, a filter similar to the leaky autocorrelator where I can adapt how fast uh, the thing adapts. So um, I tried for the FFT vocoder. If you... Oh Lord! So if you put it all down, oh, I just put that off. Now, so here, here it's not, the adaption is very low, or here it freezes completely. Don't you buy me and if you make Mercedes it too high, it sounds like Benz. just too harsh. Yeah. Sometimes it's very hard. So it can sometimes also be very nice to have a low ad uh, adaption rate to make it more uh, uh, an atmospheric sound or something like that. So, yeah. and um, but this adaption rate I, I have for all those of course. By the way. I prepared this uh, plugin here for the um, convention here, but I decided to make it a real product and sell it. That's maybe the, the bad news. The good news is you can all have it for free if you just uh, come by, give me your card, give me a hug or whatever. So, <laughs> But if you're into vocoders, you should perhaps also consider the orange vocoder by the wonderful guys from Synaptic. I was only able to come up with four different models of vocoder. They are, uh, um, have a vocoder, their new orange vocoder in the pipeline that offers 22 models. Um, so it might be more advanced than mine. 